Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to All Beer Inside, the quarantine edition episodes. Joining me today on this pandemic podcast, I have Edward, also known as T. Drinks on Instagram. Hey, what's going on, man? How you doing today? Good. Thanks for uh, letting us interview you today. I really appreciate it. Uh, so, as I do at the beginning of all the pandemic pods, uh, what are you having to drink today? Okay, so uh, tonight, definitely, this is the movement. This is the time, the place, and the energy. So, I'm actually enjoying one of the Black is Beautiful Bears. Uh, this one in particular is a collaboration brew that was done by a good friend of mine. Her name is Lori. She's a, a chef. And her um, handle on Instagram is all sauce, and that's also her website. What she does is essentially in not just infuse, but she creates meals and dishes that emulate any beer you can think of, and not just beer. She also does it with all other like spirits and uh, what have you, like uh, rum, uh, vodka, gin, that kind of thing. She creates a meal around the actual drink, and it's really purposed to to taste very reminiscent to whatever type of alcohol that she infused or used with making the, the uh, meal. Okay. So yeah, this, that's, I'm going to have to start following her for sure. Definitely. That sounds amazing. Um, I'm also, it's from forefathers brewing. I also okay. have black is beautiful uh, awesome. because I have family who lives out there. I heard yep. that it was the closest one available to me outside okay. of uh, Ba Canada. So I said, pick me up some cause uh, one, it's for supporting a great cause. Yes. And two, uh, it's very rare that there's like a world uh, outside of all together, which is also a great beer cause to support. Definitely. Um, you know, it's it's good that we're putting beer forward for causes. So Yes. Yes. And this, so uh, Lori collaborated with Nickelbrook in Burlington for this particular uh, Black is Beautiful. And uh, Black is Beautiful, just as with all together being a hosted uh, international brewing project, Black is Beautiful is yeah. actually hosted by Weathered Souls mm -hmm. Brewing, which uh, they're located in San Antonio, Texas. Awesome. Uh, yeah. And we do a virtual toast. So okay. as we go on the show, a toast. A toast. Don't have anything to cling with. <laughs> so <laughs> where'd, you, where'd you get the glassware? Mm. So Ooh. this is the uh, one of the official Black is Beautiful glasswares. Mm -hmm. Uh, so obviously saying black is beautiful on one side on the other side. I don't know if this will capture it yeah, properly, yeah, the fist. Uh, but it's the, the black earth. power fist yeah. uh, coming out of a tree. Mm -hmm. So to know your roots and showing that it is part of the earth. Uh, I was actually blessed with my glass by way of the wonderful and lovely craft bear Phoenix, AKA Miyoshi, AKA <laughs> my wonderful wife. Um, she procured our glassware from uh, a, a company or a gentleman by the name of uh poor character so okay. p, p o u r character um and uh he's based out of new jersey okay so she was able to uh to pick up a couple of glasses for us through him and uh we had to obviously wait for it to come up but when uh when she got the notification from the usps that it was uh pretty much at the border and then from Canada post to say that they officially had it. She, we, you know, we got very, very excited. And then the day that it came uh, even more excited. And the funny thing is, is the day that it came, we ended up getting bare mail from two different breweries on that day. One of the breweries was an order we placed for their version of black is beautiful. So the timing was just awesome. Yeah, it's great. And I love hearing that breweries are, are getting together uh, for this, this type of stuff. Like uh, I say, you know, you may not drink beer, but you have somebody in your life who drinks beer. Yes. Get them those beers. So, yes. And because a hundred percent of the proceeds for every black is beautiful that is done um, has to be dedicated either to an organization uh, owned, run, operated by uh, black people or an organization that is working in the community um, in regards to uh, education, community outreach, but with the uh, position of combating anti-Black racism in particular. So it's it's been a really, really great project and not a project, it's more than a project, it's mm -hmm. a movement. It's been a beautiful movement to really bring uh, awareness to the world and specifically to the craft beer, uh, craft brewing world of not only the importance of, of diversity and the fact that hello, hi, we're, we're yeah. here. Yes. Um, also uh, and, and we love beer. So. And we love beer, right? <laughs> and, and also the, the very important fact that um, the original recipe of beer, uh, despite the original law 
recipe coming from Germany, yes, mm -hmm. but the original recipe for beer was from Mesopotamia. It was yeah. created by um, it was created by women of color. So therefore, you don't have beer without us. <laughs> yeah, no, um, I you know, I'd read the history of beer and uh, like the first kind of uh, gods they prayed to were Egyptian goddesses. So yes. black female. Yes breweries so yes and yeah. the original the original brewmasters were female mm -hmm. so um you know this is all part and parcel of what this movement is helping to do uh both miyoshi and i actually have had uh, some really great opportunities to get involved uh beyond just taking pictures as we do on instagram and and helping promote breweries that are uh promoting or are actually getting involved in it uh we have actually completed our second black is beautiful bear so our original uh project uh was done our original collaboration bear was done with shacklands brewing which is in the west end of toronto and uh that one was uh fun i got to name that one um, we, uh, the adjunct that we used was Scotch bonnet peppers, which is a very traditional staple of every Caribbean household. <laughs> uh, Miyoshi being from the Bahamas. And as I mentioned, my heritage being Trinidadian. So definitely things that we grew up with, uh, in our households and our homes, uh, both here in Toronto and in Nassau, Bahamas. And what the name is that we gave it, uh, or the name that I was able to name it. So what I named it was Hot Chocolate Coffee. <laughs> Coffee spelled C-O-F-F-Y. So the reason why, the hot representing the spice of the pepper. Uh, chocolate because the way that the bear was brewed was to lean into more of the sweet to go with that spice, that sweet and spicy combination. Um, and coffee because Pam Greer, is uh, definitely one of my all-time uh, favorite actresses slash activists slash just absolutely like everyday woman crush one Wednesday type of <laughs> uh, figure. And um, she, one of her, her uh, major roles was a movie called Coffee, C-O-F-F-Y. So it's a play off the fact that it was a stout and, you know, a little kind of ode to Pam Greer. Uh, based on uh, the fact that she's definitely a prime representative of why black is beautiful. That's, that's uh, amazing. Our, our second brew was actually uh, something that was more spearheaded uh, by Miyoshi. So growing up in the Bahamas and, and in the Caribbean, there's a confectionery known as uh, coconut cakes, sugar cakes, depending on where you come from in the Caribbean. Every island kind of has their own take on it, but it's uh, definitely a confectionery, very close and dear uh, to her heart. It's a great way to represent her native lands in the Bahamas. Uh, but also, as a little girl growing up, she used to sit in the kitchen while her grandmother would put together the, the ingredients and make the confectionery. It's not a cake in a traditional stand, uh, uh, line of thinking, but it's just more of like a, um, it's more of a candy if you took a candy concept and a cake concept and kind of smushed it together without any kind of sponginess or flour based okay. uh, element, that's why, because, and because when you make it, it comes out as a, usually as a big rectangle and then you just cut individual squares out of it. So that's why it's called a coconut cake. So uh, the second collaboration black is beautiful beer that we did was with Rorschach brewing, which is in the East side of the city in the beaches area of Toronto and um it was also an imperial stout but we it was called a, a coconut cake imperial stout in honor of miyoshi um and uh her story that i just shared and um it it just absolutely was um i have to say it, it was my favorite out of the two so far it was beautifully put together super thick it came out more like more reminiscent of like a pastry stout okay um, awesome. And it, it came out at 11.9. I will tell you, I've never drank an easier, more deceptive 11.9 anything in my life when it comes to craft beer. I've, I've never had something that went down so smooth, so delicious. Um, there were elements of uh, two types of coconut that went into this brew. There was condensed milk that was used in this brew. So what you really get, I compared the first sip to uh, cold-pressed coffee mm -hmm. with 
a, a roasty, toasty, slightly sweet note of coconut. And as it starts to heat up a little bit, it edges into that nice, uh, very luxurious chocolate because there was also cocoa nibs in it mm -hmm. and a little bit of vanilla, if I remember correctly. And if you let it sit, which we normally do with our drinks, especially stouts, we let it sit for a while. It opens up, it breathes, and you find that sometimes other elements come out. So after having, uh, having it out for a little bit, you get this really super creamy mouthfeel finish. And that I believe is what was the, the condensed milk presence in it. So, uh, just... you may not see it, but watering just ah, <laughs> salivating. <laughs> salivating. Yeah. I'm, oh I'm trying to, I'm trying soon to, uh, you know, um, vacation and I'm not really going anywhere. Uh, Toronto was only six hour drive. So maybe get out there and meet up a couple of, of fellow Instagrammers and, and YouTubers and podcasters there and, and grab a couple of socially distanced beers and get to get, cause I don't have to declare beer from Toronto back to Quebec. Like I do from the U S back. So yeah, that's, that's the good thing, right? We can, we can essentially go any part of the country, come back with beer. We don't got to say nothing. We just got to enjoy it, take our pictures, yeah. have fun with it and, uh, and discover. Yeah, you, well, you mentioned Toronto beer uh, breweries, so not this past Easter, but the Easter before I was out there to visit family in Cambridge, and we did a day in Toronto, yeah. and I hit six breweries, and it was Black Labs, Lewis okay. Cipher, yep. Salt, Salter? Salter, Salter Street, Salter Street, Salter Street. Uh, Eastbound, I forget okay. the other two. Oh, well, Steam Whistle, because family wants to go see Steam Whistle, All and right. then the <laughs> Aviary, also uh, the brewery that's yep. with the Aviary, so... Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You guys. Uh, I mean, I looked it up for for purposes of the show, and there's currently 56 breweries in the GTA area. So that's insanity. Yes. It um, is. And I would could literally spend two months there and interview everybody. So. You know, the funny thing is too is that with a lot of the breweries, um, they're not all of them are not necessarily like close. Mm -hmm. It's all it's kind of a clumping. So you'll find that, like for example. When you were in the beaches area, like where you went to Black Lab, just on the same street on Eastern uh, Eastern Avenue, just down uh, further east on Eastern Avenue from Black Lab, so about maybe uh, two blocks away, is actually where Rorschach is. Okay. Um, uh, kind of just north of that area is where Godspeed is. Uh, there's a newer brewery that opened up last summer, uh, Aveling, that's also on Queen Street East. Queen Street East. Um, and then if you go further east, of course, you had mentioned, um, uh, Lord, Salter Street, uh, eastbound. Uh, you hit into the Brickwork Cider House as well, for those of you that love cider, like uh, like we do. Um, so you, you kind of have, like, that area. And then once you come across the bridge, um, it's taking you into where the aviary is and where the um, distillery district is. So you have Mill Street over there. So kind of, it's it's all kind of like clumped in certain areas. When you went to Lewis Seaford, that's up on the Danforth, but uh, just kind of north, kind of in between where Rorschach and Lewis Seaford is, you would have Left Field Brewery as well. That's the other um, one hit. Yeah. Yeah, it's like in an alleyway out of the middle of nowhere. I'm like, oh, what the, uh, like my GPS is like, turn around. I'm like, what? what? <laughs> so, and then, oh, it's in an alleyway. It Fine parking. It oh, my God. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, parking's always, yeah, like, we usually just take the TTC to code there, because, yeah. yeah, parking, parking is a joke in that area, but it's, yeah, it's smack dab in the middle of a neighborhood, um, but yeah, that's what I find is, is that with us, it's kind of clumps here and there, and then all the other breweries, it's, if you're, if you're like us, and you're not, you're not in a car, it, it is a trek, to kind of get to the other ones but then again you'll kind of hit certain spots where they kind of clump close-ish enough to each other so you're you know in some cases like with Shacklands uh next door to Shacklands on the same piece of property is Reinhard and then there's a fence and on the other side of the fence is Junction okay so if you go to Shacklands there's essentially three breweries right there that you can visit and then if you're, uh, as long as you're in car, about another 10 minutes away or so from Shacklands is People's Pint. Mm -hmm. 
So it, again, it's one of those things where it's kind of clumped in certain areas and then there's big, huge spaces and then you eventually kind of find the other places, but it's, it's a lot of fun. I don't, uh, I think, actually I can say with confidence that even myself to this day, uh, I have not been to every single brewery in my city. I've drank beer from, I believe <laughs> almost, if not all of the breweries, but I have not visited all of them. So, uh, so it, it keeps it fresh. It makes it fun for me when I actually can uh, hit somewhere I've never been to before. And therefore for me, it's kind of fun because one, I, I get to go somewhere I've never been. And two, uh, I will almost by default get to try uh, a beer that they've made that I've never had before. So kind of like a two for one, yeah. which is really, it's cool. I mean, I can hear all the passion uh, about beer behind by, behind your words. And like I, I said, prior to the program uh, in your Instagram, where does, where does that discovery of craft beer come from? Where did you discover craft beer? Um, to, to really look at my current beer venture um, I started going down the rabbit hole um, and sharing the bear venture with Miyoshi um, about maybe four or five years ago. I know one of the first places that we got um, that was craft beer uh, was actually Bellwoods was one of the first places that we got craft beer from. Cause I know, I, I know when you say things like if you say something like mill street, Mm -hmm. People jump at you because they're no longer a craft brewery. Uh, I know it's, it's, it's a, it's a tightrope act, yeah, but yeah, but yeah, no, uh, Bellwoods definitely was one of the first places that I, I had craft beer from. And um, it, it was, it was not just a learning experience for me, but it was elevating my understanding in general of, of what it is to have beer and to know that I can, I can try different things and, uh, what my concept of beer was at that point, which was a lot, a lot of mainly macro, um, but with, with some European influences thrown in. Um, my dad is, uh, like I said, my mom is from Trinidad originally. My dad is a Scottish Ukrainian mix. So growing up in my household, uh, you, uh, when you come from that kind of situation, there's two things you have no excuse not to partake of partying, <laughs> and, in, and, and, in, and, and enjoying some alcohol. And when I say enjoying alcohol, I'm not talking about pounding and getting yeah. completely trashed. I'm talking about actually appreciating and enjoying alcohol and understanding the ways that it can enhance any circumstance, but especially social situations where you can share that experience with others. These, these are things I feel it's almost a default by my blood alone. Um, but uh, that, that kind of influence, having, um, having the awe and the mystery taken away from me at an early age is something to this day that I really appreciate my parents doing because I grew up seeing a lot of my friends, uh, you know, get their first stealing from their parents liquor cabinet and in my head i used to think my parents have like li you know good couple of liquor cabinets in my house there's you know liquor that's on the floor um because the, the cabinets are not big enough for it yeah. um but I, never once never once did it ever crawl into my head ooh, ooh when they're not looking take a sip i was always encouraged i was always told that if you know uh, the only time that you take anything is if we give it to you and it was only ever something um that was shared with me at a younger age on a special occasion like you know like new year's you get a little taste of wine from mom mm -hmm. or get a little taste of champagne like it's nothing where i went on a bender with my dad at six <laughs> you know what i mean it was no you'd be that. italian then so no. <laughs> <laughs> but um, again, like I said, taking demystifying alcohol for me at an early age is something that definitely paid dividends as I became uh, a teenager and as I, you know, became an adult. Uh, it it helped shape my understanding of the fact that you you don't need to be uh, fully inebriated in order to appreciate what a drink can bring to the table and the way that it can definitely enhance. A, a social event 
and you still be in full control of yourself. You still treat people with respect and most importantly, treat yourself with respect. Mm -hmm. Um, That said, like everybody else in the world, I've had my, I've had my uh, occasions where I've overindulged, but um, always with that understanding in the back of my head that if I'm making a conscious decision to do something, it's one thing, but if I'm just going out with the intent uh, every single time I'm around alcohol that I got to like be stupid with it, never, ever anything that interested me. And uh, it really does come from that experience from a young age. So that kind of shaped me going down this path of experimenting with alcohol uh with my with my mom's caribbean influence especially uh most of the the harder liquor that i've enjoyed uh has has really been more you know different types of rum um because obviously one of the biggest alcohols made and distilled in the caribbean is rum especially because of the presence of the natural ingredients sugar you know raw sugar sugar cane uh, to be able to make some of the best rum in the world. Um, it, it's definitely something that is uh, passed on to you. So with these type of influences and being able to shape that into my adult experience, uh, my response, my responsible adult res- experience, um, I've had various things kind of brought to me, but as far as really kind of actively pursuing craft beer, it really kind of started with the first time that uh, Miyoshi and I took a trip to Bellwoods about four years ago, four or five years ago, give or take. And one of the first things that I drank by them was actually their, um, their Blackberry Jelly King. Okay. One of the first things. And that was only because that was actually Miyoshi's drink, but I asked if I could have a sip. And we always share with each other. So th- that ended, I ended up having, I forget what I actually ordered, but I, I, before I tasted what I ordered, I asked if after she had her first sip, if I could have a sip of that. And I just handed her my glass of whatever mm-hmm. I ordered. Um, so that was officially the first time that I ever had a Bellwoods beer. Um, and like I said, it was just a, kind of an eye opening and aha type of uh, moment of kind of getting a, uh, obviously a very very small window into the rabbit hole that I was about to fall into uh quite willingly and uh really get to know more about uh beer as a whole and I think that's been one of the greatest joys and benefits kind of twofold further being reminded in life that for all that you know you know nothing because you can always learn more you'll Mm -hmm. never learn everything that there is to learn um and uh being able to, uh, to again, uh, to have this bare education, as I call it, this this path has brought me in touch with everybody from the person working behind the counter serving the beer uh, to brewmasters, head brewers, uh, you know, brewers in general, brewery owners. But having access to these various people, salespeople, uh, marketing people, being able to talk to all of them it's been an education and it still is an ongoing education for me that is so valuable um, being able to actually learn more about brewing, uh, learn more about um, how something goes from being raw ingredients to a final product um, specifically with alcohol, but uh, just drinks in general. It's, it's really been a fascinating uh, experience and that's part of what I believe really supercharges my passion and keeps me wanting to, to continue. Uh, you're trying yourself and beer diversity also, well, Ren, uh, yes. previous interview are trying to bring more, more forwardness to the beer industry about, Hey, you know, we're black. We drink too. I have a friend, Dennis, he's uh, Filipino and Trinidadian mm-hmm. and I'm always the one served first. Why not him? And I, I kind of always question that. Now he does get served on like the recent cowbell incident. He does get served. We've never had an issue where we've gotten into a brewery and they've said like, hey, sorry, you can't. We've never had that issue. Maybe it's the culture in Quebec. I'm not sure. Okay. Uh, but, you know, what kind of steps do you feel you can take to bring more diversity to uh, the beer industry with yourself and Ren kind of together? If you were to like join as a super team of diversity in beer, let's do this. Um. I have nothing but 
the absolute most like the utmost amount of of respect beer uh, you know for for ren ren is one of my beer heroes sorry i got my line kind of mixed up there but <laughs> ren 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 is one of my beer heroes uh i am blessed that not only do i know her but i i consider her to be my sister and uh, i love her to pieces the work she has been tirelessly doing it is uplifting empowering frustrating <laughs> Because right now, watching her, sometimes it, it reminds me of the tale of Atlas. Being a titan, where you can carry the weight of the world on your shoulders, quite literally. But should she have to? That's the real question that nobody necessarily asks. Um, one of the things that really put me on about the bear community was my initial experience. My initial experience with most of the people that I met and that I have, in some cases, uh, had the blessing and the opportunity to get to know better is that it, it felt as approachable as the drink. I often give people an example. If alcohol were to have a party, a house party, it would be at Bear's house. Bear would be the person greeting you at the door and making sure that you remain comfortable throughout your stay. Bear would be the person to introduce you and make you feel like you're the superstar, even though it's Bear's party. You know, that to me is how I felt initially with a lot of the people I came into contact with in the Bear community because I started going to breweries, I started going to various uh, festivals and other events, um, uh, both individually and, uh, and with my wife. And what I found was that a lot of the people that I started getting to meet primarily by talking to them on Instagram first, and then ending up at a same event, sometimes planned, a lot of the times not planned, but just by chance. And having them received me in a way that I felt, I felt warm. I felt comfortable. Um, and I thought, Hey man, this is, this is real cool. This is really, you know, uh, it's real kind of interesting to, to, to be, to be this far into my, my adulthood and be able to find another group of like-minded people, um, who seem to really be, you know, accepting was the initial experience throughout time i have seen obviously you know that sheen that honeymoon stage does not last very long like any honeymoon stage and i feel generally speaking that for people of color we our honeymoon stage feels you know a lot unfortunately in a lot of cases feels a lot shorter than the average honeymoon. And um, I've come to see other sides to some of the people that I thought were people who I considered, you know, bare fam, I considered, you know, friends, extended family. I've come to see other sides of some of them um, in a, a negative light. And in some cases, I've come to see some of them in an even more positive light. Uh, especially through a specific incident that happened uh, during June and um, involved a group that I, that Miyoshi and I were considered to be co-founders of, uh, not the head founders, but co-founders. Uh, we put a lot of love, time, and effort into and to essentially see the whole thing fall apart because something happens to a member of our community our child had to watch a man alongside us had to watch a man be killed by a group of people who we have raised her to understand if she needs help, these are people she can go to. These are people you call out to. If you need help, you call a cop. And having to go through everything that happened at the end of May, knowing that this is another 
parable in the never ending story yeah, I know. of, of, uh, of blackness. This is being indoctrinated into being black. This is part and parcel of what we live, what we experience. And it, it doesn't matter. Um, it doesn't matter where we're located because some people think, Oh, you know, these things don't happen in, uh, Canada, you know, yeah. Yeah. uh, I experienced my, my first, um, my first run in with racism happened when I was five years old in senior kindergarten by my teacher. Uh, what breaks my heart is that my child's first experience, thankfully she doesn't really remember it. And I, I had to re I had to retell the story, um, in, uh, our recent chats since everything that happened at the end of May. Um, but her first experience was at, this is 2020. I know it's this is 2020 and to know that essentially 10 years ago it means it was 2010. Yeah, I know. But to bring it into our particular discussion um yeah there are definitely situations there are definitely places where um we go and we feel comfortable but even some of the places we feel most comfortable uh issues may so still happen um it doesn't unfortunately doesn't always fall on my shoulders a lot of that strain falls on miyoshi's shoulders uh microaggressions are real and they're scary and it's uh, something as simple like you said your your buddy showing up first but being served second um two of us placing an order and i may go for i may go for a medium i may go for a little or i may go for a big boy mm -hmm. uh abv wise my wife comes from the bahamas just like me she grew up around alcohol she's no stranger <laughs> She could probably out drink a lot of guys bigger than me <laughs> under the table with, with ease. Yet she'll order, say, for example, she'll order a beer. Um, that's, I don't know, like say it's 10%. And I just placed an order, even if I placed an order for another beer, but it's also like say nine, 10% or something. No question. Okay, and you, what would you like? Oh, you know, I, I'd like to get this. Do you know it's 10%? Yeah. Do you know what the ABV means? Do you know that it's hoppy? Do you know that imperial, do you know what, an, have you had an imperial stout? I didn't get asked a question. But my wife got to face like 20 questions just to have her order completed. Uh, she's had her beer changed on her before. Yeah. I, like you said, we're, we're 20, uh, well, the problem is maybe cause we're 2020 from the stuff I see online nowadays. Yeah. Uh, I went to high school where my skin color was a minority, which I actually think that made me, I, I've had friends of color since I was six. I've just okay. never, you know, these incidents happen, we talk about it. And then I, I kind of try and say, like, how can I help? Uh, but, you know, being kind of a nobody, just still raising my voice on social media or whatever, I, I find helps and counteracting <clears throat> who I call my idiot white friends who aren't mm -hmm. really my friends anymore, because I've yeah. had to cut them out of my life simply for their toxic attitudes towards this kind of stuff. Yeah. I don't need to see your negativity anymore. Be part of the solution, not part of the problem. Exactly. Uh, it's the same concept when I hear somebody say, oh, go back to your country. Uh, dude, do a 23 and me and go back to yours. Well, what does that mean? I mean, do a 23 and me and whatever percentage of European is major, go back to that European country. <laughs> oh, oh, they took our jobs. Well, actually, the corporation you work for took your job away from you. You know. Oh, it, well, no, that's not the way it works. I'm like, you know what? If you were to educate yourself and not see it through, you know, negative view. Yeah smarten yourself up 
it wouldn't be a problem and maybe you'd be a little more awake and understand the plight that the people of color are going through right have been going through since the 1600s yeah you know yeah. um and the fact that some people still see it as like oh they're they're after us they're after white fragility is just no they're not we're all trying to get along we're trying to be humanity let's survive this yep. we're going through a pandemic and things are getting worse somehow yeah you know it's it's as having, having to deal with uh and sorry i, I didn't mean to cut into no, no no more you're made, more than welcome made, to you, you made a lot of great points and going off of what you're sharing with me that you know actions and steps you've taken in your life not only to raise your awareness and your see it, it, it really goes hand in hand and people think it's the same thing awareness consciousness not the same thing they are two separate things you can be aware that something happens but if you're not conscious that you're participating in that thing that's happening you're going to continue to repeat a poor past in the future and uh so to hear some of the things that you've had to do and i know uh I, it can't be easy especially cutting people out of your life uh I'm I'm a pretty for the people who know me well. I'm a pretty happy-go-lucky guy. I'm a pretty easygoing person. Um, I used to be I, I used to be a club promoter. I I'm definitely in 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 uh, if I if I was any one of the characters in that description about alcohol having a party, I'd so be beer. Yeah, <laughs> I would so be beer. I I like knowing that I can bring the party to people, I can bring joy to people, I can make sure that they're, you know, my people are good, they're comfortable, that's all I want. If you come around me, I just want to make sure that you're good and we have a good time, we have some laughs and make some good memories because when you got to go through your daily grind, uh, it's tough, it's frustrating, it's a lot of negatives that uh, we potentially can incur um, and we need relief. We need release and we need relief. And the only way you're going to do that is by letting the good endorphins get activated in you. And that comes from just trying to maintain a positive attitude and, and share that to the best of your ability with people you come in contact with. And trust, I have my good days and bad days. And I'm, I'm never a person to claim that I'm a hundred percent on point or that I am always Mr. Happy. But uh, you know, I, that's what I like to, to try to do to the best of my ability. So I know that it is tough to cut out people, especially if these are people you've grown close to. Uh, these are people you, you love or you care about. And you just, you can see the toxicity clear as day. Like if they were walking around with a visible aura, it's that obvious to everybody but themselves. That's the perfect example they may be aware that racism exists, but if they're not conscious of their actions that contribute to that situation, they're going to continue doing what they do and they're going to continue to feel righteous, self-righteous about it and not want to change, which is disappointing and heart-wrenching. But this, uh, this goes into what I was trying to say is, is that a lot of the traits that you, dis that you talk about um, are traits that I have been pairing with a, a term that's not new, but I but it's definitely been something I've been saying a lot more of lately, which is being an authentic ally. Uh, an authentic ally I define as being somebody who doesn't just talk about it, but they are about it. They be about it. They back up what they're saying. They don't just throw up a black tile no. Uh, for one day in no, June okay. and they feel like, hey, listen, what do you black people want from me? Uh, you know, I put up the tile. I'm down with it. I'm cool. I'm hip, whatever, you know, it's, that's not it. That is so yeah. not yeah. it. And if you, if you don't even know, you're just putting a hashtag because that's what people are telling you to put, or you saw it somewhere else, then it means you don't even know what you're doing. And something that I, you know, something that we try to impress upon our child all the time is to be fully aware of what you're doing, when you're doing, how you're doing, but most importantly, why you are doing. Always know the why. If you don't know the why, don't do it. There's no point. I've told, we, we've both told her, like, when it comes to something, for example, like apologizing, when you apologize and it's authentic, 
the person that you're apologizing to walks away with a feeling like, even if they're still mad at you, they walk away with a feeling of relief to at least be like, at least they know what they did. They owned it. They took some level of responsibility. I pray that they, it leads to them changing and growing from it. But that was an authentic apology. Mm-hmm. Playing into the uh, issue, the recent issue that you brought up with Cowbell, that was not an authentic anything. No, not even that, close. That was, barely, that was barely a Doug Ford-esque, uh, <laughs> I'm, I, I'm sorry if you're offended by what I said. Yeah. You know what I mean? It, it, was, it was that to me, Doug Ford saying that is more authentic than what, you know, Cowbell ended up saying. And yeah. why, it's, why it's that Don is. The Don Cherry incident last year, like. Very much. What's you wrong know what with I mean? you? I, I know you're a convergent old white guy, but come on. <laughs> there, there has <laughs> to be something in you where you've been around enough people. Um, and some of those people have been people of color, especially in hockey. Like Don Cherry is a person who he, he watched PK. He knows the Subans, mm-hmm. right? He, he PK's dad used to used to help with coaching in the minors with them, right? In, in the you know like the like Timbits or whatever, like the Pee Wee, you know, yeah. mm-hmm. like their dad has always uh, been involved in in the brothers' uh, hockey careers uh, from when they could learn to skate. Um, you know, Don Cherry will tell you that he's known the Subans for quite a quite a long time. You know. Um, but it's, it's not enough to just be like, I have black friends. I know a black family. I employ black people. Like, that's wonderful. You gave them a job, like, good for you. I would hope that you didn't give them the job just because they turned up at an interview and they were the only black face that turned up right. and you were like hired. Yeah. That, that's, <laughs> I, um, resume. Uh, I was listening to the TSN podcast and, and Hal Johnson, or as us Canadians know, uh, from participation, yeah. He'd applied, he applied for a job at TSN back in the day. And yes. they're like, Oh, sorry, we already have a black guy. Yep. And that was, and you know what the scary, the, you know, the scary thing, the scary, or the scary est thing of all of that was that when he applied, it was the eighties. People talk of times gone sometimes like they are this mystical, magical land like Mordor or something that existed like a gazillion years ago. And it's like, um, no, that was less than 50 years ago, my friends. And especially being a baby of the 80s, a, a, a baby of the 70s, a child of the 80s, a teen of the 90s, and as I <laughs> used to love to say to people, a man of the future, um, you know, having grown having been alive for the entirety of the the decade known as the eighties, I can tell you that is not that far a time away. And uh, to know that in a, in a year that had 1980, anything you could go for a job interview, kill the job interview, have all the qualifications they desire to back up your ability to to be the right choice, the right fit for this job, strictly looking at your resume and your skill set, A plus, A plus, A plus, knock the interview out the park. And you're going to get a phone call from somebody sounding, you know, apologetic, saying, you are a beautiful man, but unfortunately, we've already got our black guy. Yeah, I know. It's- we can't have two. You know, we can't have two. That's, you know, one, one is a lot, two would be too, too many. So, and that's the, again, the eighties, Yeah. you know, the eighties, it's not that far away. And for me to be able to say that my child's first experience with racism was at the age of three. And that was only 10 years ago. It is further mind boggling. When you start to, when you start to, to develop a thread of a timeline and you connect that thread together. Um, yeah, it's really rather unpleasant and thinking that Hal Johnson had that experience. And I know that that was not his first taste of racism in his life, but he had that experience in the eighties. My first taste of racism was in the eighties. Like again, 
just a thread, a thread, a thread. And you start to connect these things and you really wonder where, where are we in the world? The fact alone that Ren has to do the things that she is doing to try and impress upon the craft beer community and the industry, the importance of celebrating diversity on a daily basis, not just during June and you put up a rainbow, not just, or, or, or in June, you, you play from start to finish of the month, you play black artists on your speakers. Not that you actually have a black artist be paid to perform at your brewery, but it's black music month. So let's just, you know, let's put it on the urban station and, and I'll leave that alone, but let's put it on the urban station from, from opening of shift to close of shift. Uh, so that, you know, uh, if black people hear it, maybe they'll come, uh, maybe they'll tell a friend, um, and, uh, come Canada day. Well, we'll just have to figure out why, you know, no more black people show up for the well, other I mean, 11 months. Why it, no more, no more LGBTQ plus uh, patrons show up the other 11 months. We'll just have to figure that out, you know, but it's, it is Canada day. So we have to play Nickelback. That's kind well, of the rule. Come I on. Mean. And Brian Adams. <laughs> oh God. Don't. Yeah. He's got his own problems now. So Maestro Fresh West. Oh, oh. Cardinal I mean, official. Yeah. Brian um, Adams. Yes. Summer of 69, brother. Yeah. Yes. Until his most recent uh, Instagram image. So yeah. yeah. Um, forget Brian. Well, forget is the nice word I'm going to use for Brian. Adams. So. <laughs> awesome. No, uh, honestly, yeah. At the, at the end of the day to, to know that it is 2020 and we still have to do all of these things. Um, to, To go through the month I had in June, personally, my birthday is in June, and I already prepared to know that, okay, it's COVID, can't do the things I would normally do to celebrate, can't call people to be like, hey, let's all meet at a brewery and let's let's have a pint to my birthday, whatever, can't do any of those things. Um our daughter asked me, daddy, uh, do you have the time off? And I had, as I always do every year, I, I took some time off, um, around my birthday. And I said, yes. And it's like, what do you want to do, daddy? What do you want to do? And I, I told her that, uh, I'm like, honey, I'm trying not to think about daddy's birthday because if I do, I'm just going to make myself upset knowing that I can't go out. I can't do the fun things mm -hmm. I would normally do. And I said, the last thing I want to do is be around the two most beautiful women in my life and uh, be an absolute wet blanket for my birthday. That's the last thing I want to do. So she understood uh, yeah. to the best of her ability. And uh, needless to say, uh, Father's Day and my birthday were still made very awesome, very special. But uh, all the other things that happened in June, yeah, all I the know. other unpleasantries, uh, you know, um, and, and silver linings among them. You know, I had an opportunity to uh, go to one of the protests here in Toronto. There was, there was a few of them, but I actually caught wind. I, I always happen to catch wind of these things, like, right after they've happened. And I see it on the news, and I'm like, this happened today? What the? But, uh, but one of them I was able to catch wind of just before it happened. So um, when I had finished work that day, uh, I, I left out the part, I left out of our home. Uh, I went down over to uh, the area on Young Street where it started. And I marched, we, we marched from just above Young and Bloor um, all the way down to City Hall. Um, and it, it was a terrific experience. I've been socially active since the age of about Four, because my dad used my my mother uh, was a very politically active individual from when she was a little girl in Trinidad, um, and uh, my dad used to uh, my parents used to do uh, canvassing and other types of uh, volunteering on various uh, political candidates campaigns. So uh, my dad, my first taste of that was going canvassing with my dad door to door. I was in charge of the flyers, the pamphlets, 
and uh walk you and know, hold these papers <laughs> exactly well, you know, walk with dad hold these papers and uh if, if you know give them to the nice nice people who come to the door so that's that was my first uh taste of uh you know political and social active uh, activation i guess uh so or activity um so marching marching in this protest was not really a new experience for me but this doing it for for doing it for my own community um in this unique s- circumstance was definitely a first time for me and i am i'm i'm really happy about it but what made me a little bit proud of it was um you know uh Miyoshi wasn't feeling well so she couldn't come with me and um I asked my daughter if she wanted to come covid covid's had a lot of impact yeah. on the household and on everybody and you know uh understandably I I I stressed to her that I'm not at all imposing um if she says no I totally respect her decision so she just said, you know, daddy, I, I think I just want to stay home. I said, okay, no problem. But then she said something to me before I left, um, which was a wake up call and also put the, a little taste of the fear of God in me because, <laughs> you know, you, you, you get amped up and charged up. Like, yeah, let's do this. But then the, the truth of reality always finds a way to sometimes seep its way into your head <laughs> to be like, okay, yeah, yes, yes, do this. However, she just looked at me, held my face, and she said, Daddy, please make sure when you go out there that you stay safe and that you come back home to Mommy and I. And she gave, she gave, me, she gave me a kiss on my cheek. She kissed <laughs> the top of my head. Yeah. And, and she went back to what she was doing. And then as she was turning the corner to go back to what she was doing, she uh, kind of yelled out, make sure you put on your mask and gloves. <laughs> Like, okay, yes, ma'am. Yes, yeah, Captain. Yeah. Um, but in that moment, it was a little sobering for me to remember, yeah, even though it's Toronto and even though it's Canada, uh, a protest march is still a protest march. Yeah. And you don't know how police are going to react. You don't know how people, which uh, is funny. I usually get teased all the time that I can't be taken anywhere because there always ends up being somebody who knows me. Uh, that I run into, but, uh, this was the first time where I, during the March, I was by myself. I ended up running into somebody once we got to city hall, but for the, for the entirety of the, the, uh, the route, uh, I was marching beside people, but nobody I knew. So I was Mm -hmm. really kind of by myself, um, while being among people and, um, the, uh, you know, that's where my, my daughter's words kind of played into my head and uh, to just be like, okay, cool. Everything's peaceful. Everything's good. Nobody's doing anything too unnecessary. Uh, There were police that were escorting the parade route. Um, So they were not really interacting with us. They weren't being at all negative or uh, they weren't aggressively managing the situation. They were letting it happen. Uh, but just making sure that we didn't get hit by cars, which was cool. Um, It was overall a really positive experience. But those words from my daughter, uh, that little pep talk, um, definitely kept my... Reaching in the chest. and (laughs) You know, it definitely kept me on my toes, kept me a little more sharp to not take for granted the fact that it is a protest march, but it's in Canada. Yeah. You know, no, Uh, it's, it's, it's in Canada but it's still a protest march. And part of the things being uttered, of course, are uh, no justice, no peace, defund the police, and you got police escorting us, so you never know. You never know, right? And you never know with the people, too. You never know. One person sees that the cops, they may get a little bit louder. They may get a little bit closer uh, to the area where the police are standing. You never know. Mm -hmm. So being aware, being alert is nothing new to me, but my daughter's pep talk reminded me to be alert, be aware. Um, but the silver lining was not just in participating in the parade itself and uh, a sense of pride and joy that washed over me for doing it, but 
it was when I came home, my daughter came out of, uh, out of the room and, uh, you know, gave me after I washed my hands and everything, gave me the biggest hug, looked me in my face and said, you know what, dad, I'm proud of you. Thank you for marching for us today. Thank you for marching for our community because I know it's important and I'm proud of you for doing it. And that right there said so much to me and it filled me, it filled my heart, um, which is pretty big to begin with, but uh, <laughs> kind of like the Grinch, I felt like she grew it, you know, two, yeah. two sizes three, bigger three, that five, day, yeah. three, you know, three, five sizes bigger that day. And, um, and it, it, it bolstered me to be like, yeah, this is what you were taught to do. Not just being black, but growing up in a household that was very socially, very politically active. This is what you were taught to do. This is the right thing. It's what you're, it's nothing to win an award or have a pat on the back. No, no. This is the least you can do. So you did it. Good for doing it. You're supposed to. Plus and, coming from a multiracial family on top of that. Yeah. It's, it's, it's even more imbued in you that this needs to be done. Yes. And, and it's, it's understanding, um, it's understanding and, and, and acknowledging and embracing all of what makes you, you at all times and still understanding that in the world, you're still first and foremost, a black man to anybody that sees you, anybody after people get to know you. Okay. Sure. They may be able to say, Oh, he's a kind spirit. He's a, good man he's an interesting individual uh he's a jerk he's a whatever <laughs> you know but before they call you anything they're gonna call you black man or before they call you anything they're gonna call you a black woman before they call you anything they're gonna call you a black child and you need to understand that that is not a bad thing that that is not a source of distress or shame it is negativity is another pride. probably word yeah you yeah, know it's... it doesn't it doesn't have to be a negative thing from the internalizing that you will definitely do you have to to internalize it in a way that it goes to your consciousness it goes to your awareness to remember it's 2020 racism still alive and well oh yeah you still got work to do Get your butt on the line. Do your work. Put in that work. Keep doing it till you don't gotta or until the good Lord above calls you home to glory, whatever comes first. Um, but I mean, I, I tell my friends all the time, like anybody ever says anything about your skin color and I'm there, you don't do anything. I'll do something because <laughs> you'll get in a lot more trouble than before I will. Now, am I willing to take an assault charge for you? Maybe. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I'll use my words first, and maybe if the other heavier set white guy yells at the white guy for being a racist piece of garbage, then mm -hmm. maybe said white guy might get it. But yeah. uh, unfortunately, sometimes you're talking to brick walls. Um, yeah. I'm also from a society where the, the Francophone aren't exactly the – not all – that'd be lumping everybody together just like people are like, Oh, there are, there are, you know, there aren't all bad cops, but from what we're seeing, there's a lot of bad cops right now. Yeah. Uh, it's the same concept of like, you know, not all Francophones are negative, but oh. the people we voted in have decided that if you wear a face covering, you're not allowed to, you know, I'm not cool with that stuff. That's the way my parents brought me up is don't, yep. don't be that way. I have an uncle who I basically said, you know, I'm not talking to you until you stop using a very negative word for black people. Yeah. Until you stop using that word, yeah. I don't consider you family anymore. And, and it's something and, that, you know, I'm I'm one person in an army of a few million, but unfortunately there's billions who, who see it otherwise. So. Yeah. And you know what, though? I mean, th this is the thing. And this is, this is part of the message that I think um, – that that I am trying to use my my platform to help hammer home is if you consider yourself an ally first of all never call yourself an ally ever you're only an ally when somebody calls you an ally 
from the group you're trying to help. You can say that I, I do my best to educate myself. I do my best to be supportive of people I consider my friends, my family, my chosen family in a lot of cases. Um, but whatever you do, you never call yourself an ally. That's that group's job to do. I never call myself an ally of women. I have been blessed where some of the many women in my life have seen me as an ally and they've expressed that to me. And I wear that like a stripe on or a badge on or, and I will take that to my grave knowing that even if one woman in this world thinks that I've been an ally to feminism, I've been an ally to, to their cause as individuals just to be treated with respect, then okay, I've, I haven't done too badly, you know? But I never go around calling myself an ally. Uh, the closest you can do is say something like, I call, call myself a feminist. I can do that. Um, but, you know, obviously when you start labeling yourself, <laughs> labels come with expectations. And if you if somebody feels you're not living up to an expectation, they're going to call you on it. And if you use the label, they have every right to. Yeah. Um, you know, that is the troubling part of labels. But um, in being an ally, the first thing, honestly, that every ally needs to understand, especially where a lot of people feel that they have become activated uh, after what happened to George Floyd, um, after what happened to Breonna Taylor, after what happened to so many individuals oh, in the uh, state. Unfortunately, it's at the point where names are getting lost because oh, it happens yes. so often. It, it, truly. Uh, and not and again, to stress, not just in America, but in Canada. No, uh, in, the, in, the casino in incident uh, to, with one of the native yeah. leaders in the RCMP. Yeah. I mean, uh, honestly, the way that our indigenous brothers and sisters are still, still being treated um, in 2020. Uh, it is not only disgusting, but it is silly to hear the, to hear the leader of the RCMP get interviewed. And as a woman, as a woman, she's like, Oh, there's no racism. There's no such racism, uh, no such thing as racism or systemic yeah, uh, system, ill treat sy yeah. systemic racism or ill treatment of any individual in the RCM. I'm, I'm like, you're <laughs> here's, a the, woman, here's the video. Right? Yeah, but <laughs> no, no, no. Let's let's put a let's put a pin in what happened to the chief yeah. for one second. Yeah. You said that there is no systemic ills being faced by any member of the RCMP. You're the lead person of the RCMP, right? You're a woman, right? So are you telling me it was easy street from when you became an RCMP officer and you just skyrocketed to the top and no man stood in your way? No man called you a female dog? No, no man used any derogatory term against you ever? Yeah. Who was a senior officer? Uh, who was a colleague level officer who was an officer below you are what what imaginary world have what bubble are you living in where that never happened because every woman I know who has ever accomplished anything in their life has always gone through some ill treatment just because they're a woman, whether it's by a man or whether it's by another woman. And that's just women, period. Not necessary, not, I'm not specifying women of color. I'm not specifying indigenous women, black yeah. women, or white women, just womanhood. Every woman I know, every woman that's ever been in my life in any capacity, starting with my mother and going out from there, I've never heard any of them ever say life has been awesomely terrific from start to finish. I've never ever faced sexism in any form, form or fashion ever, ever. I've never been passed over for a promotion, no matter how worthy I was by a man who is way less experienced, way less worthy, who's even been written up for infractions in the company and not just uniform infractions. But uh, I've never, no, I've never experienced that. So for you to say that nobody in your, in, in the RCMP has ever faced any systemic um, 
uh, ill treatments. Um, and, and furthermore, to double down by saying systemic racism doesn't exist in the RCMP. Um, I don't know. I don't know what to say to that, but I don't believe it. So bringing back in the incident that happened to the chief, it was just so ironic that when the light of day hit the situation, 100% they mishandled everything about that circumstance. And you, at that point, should have started backtracking but then you come and make this statement and it's like no no i'll tell you what my experience is i've come to learn um having friends and family members who have become or been police officers not just in canada but in other countries um worked with different groups within canada um i i've come to learn very well and from personal experience come to learn very well that there is a considered hierarchy. Uh, it kind of goes like this. And I'm minimizing it, of course. Mm -hmm. Security guards. Any security company. Could be the best in the country, worst in the company. Doesn't matter. Security guards. Get looked down on by Metro Police. Okay? In Ontario, the other regional police forces... OPP. Durham, uh, yeah, whoever, they, although they're at the same level of Metro Toronto, they look down on them. They look down on them. They beef with each other. But OPP yeah. looks down on all of them. And then yeah. RCMP, RCMP yeah. looks down on OPP. That's the hierarchy. That's how it works. Simple. So knowing that this is what it is, it gives you very – interesting perspective of how you get treated by this by the various groups that police the various areas that you go to in the province and again i'm only talking about ontario i'm not talking about any of the other provinces but the concept the concept is you plug in the different names yeah. but the concept is the same okay the concept is 100% the same. And every so often, certain incidents, definitely, you find that you do get collaboration between those levels, and they work nicely. And other times, it's exactly just, it's a pissing contest. And if you're further down the stream, it's going to rain on you. You know, water, water doesn't float up, it flows <laughs> yeah, down. No, no. You know? Yeah. As, so, as having to delay our conversation tonight, water definitely flows down to yeah, some places. Exactly, so. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So, yeah. you know, at the end of the day, it, it, it puts you, it gives you perspective to see the infighting and the ill treatment that exists within their ranks, within the various police forces. Now, I haven't even got inside one of those groups to talk about all the in-house shenanigans oh, yeah because of course uh beat cops oh. get looked down upon by detectives but then if you're a part of like a special squad like guns and gangs you look down on those detectives yeah. and so on and so on and so on and so on right there's there's always so, i mean and then we're talking about race like the founders incident yeah you know it's that guy was looked down on because of his skin color it's like what is going on here yeah like beer yeah. Beer to me is supposed to be for everybody. You said beer is the host. Yeah. We're supposed to include beer for everything. So it's the same, like, why can't all the law offices get along? Why can't the military see them, not see themselves above these people? And it's right. And it, we're in, we're in such a connected age now. Yeah. Why it's, are it's, we more separated than ever? And that's the funny thing. I tell people all the time. I'm like, we live in the information age and we have the highest level of electronic connectivity, yet we are uh, humanely the most disconnected set of generations that this planet has ever seen because every single thing is on a screen. Not knocking the fact that obviously you're not here and I'm not there and this screen allows us to connect, but we're actually having conversation. We're connecting within the connection. Most people aren't doing that. They're only going to the surface and then taking what they want from what they see and then moving on. But there's no actual connectivity, you know? Um, but that's my point is when you can 
look at the grander scape or the grander scheme of things it doesn't condone the misbehavior it doesn't condone the poor treatment it doesn't condone programming like carding that goes on especially here in toronto that goes on quite religiously despite the fact that they keep talking about oh yeah we're, we're gonna we're gonna eliminate that from uh you know our our various uh, policing techniques, and they it's still it's they've been saying that for almost more than a decade, and it still goes on. Um, it's uh, what is it, it? New York City stop and frisk? Yeah, stop and frisk, stop. right? Uh, you, you, what did you get? What happened? How come you're late? I got pulled over for what? Driving while black? You know, it 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 is it is one of those uneasy jokes that we make within our own community. That it's one of those things where we kind of laugh about it, but it's not funny because it's funny it's funny because it's true yes you know um but my point is is that when you can see all of these separations between the various ranks and you can see all of the aggressions between the various ranks as a common citizen do you stand a chance especially (laughs) if you are not rich white and male your, your chances, when you don't fit those, not one of those three categories, by the way, all three categories, you have to be rich, white, and male, where it empowers you to the greatest degree in the society we live in. If you are rich and male, you will maybe have access to some of the privileges, but at the end of the day, you're not white. Yeah. So you're not going to go to the boys club. Okay. You have to make your own. Um, and if you go to the boys club, they expect you to be there to serve them in one form or the other. And I'll just leave that there. But if you fit the bill of those three things, you check off each box, that's the level where your white privilege begins. If you check off the box of being white and male, your privilege goes down a little. Because obviously there's things that rich people can do in general. And this is not a knock on, on being wealthy. I encourage everybody to be wealthy. I want to be, oh, yeah. before, before I hang it up, I definitely <laughs> want to be wealthy. But um, understanding that wealth and money is nothing but energy. And if you can harness that energy, you can use it for amazing things. It's not this evil biblical creature that we keep hearing about being the root of all evil it's just energy but well i mean unless you're jeff bezos he's pretty close to super villain right now so <laughs> yeah, yeah he's he he was doing some good things and now he's got himself caught up in some real bad things uh, you know mismanagement but um for sure you know what i mean like uh, that privilege starts to shrink as you go down the rank and file but it starts with rich white man White man, uh, man, white, oh. rich woman, because that's the joke. There's still a lot of white men that have more privilege than a rich white woman, mm-hmm. but that is what it is. And same thing, right? So rich white woman, white woman. And then basically after you hit, after you get out of white and you, and you continue to kind of free fall down that list, uh, the, the word privilege becomes, it's like, uh, it's like Homer <laughs> fading into the bush, you know, it's yeah. exactly like yeah. that. It's like when Homer's out of the bush, that is rich, white, <laughs> male privilege level. And as he continues to fade into that bush, that's the sense of privilege being taken away until he fades completely into the bush and privilege is gone. And that means whoever at that point is still looking at that bush, it means that you're not those things. And therefore any privilege you have is highly limited. If you continue to live within the same general societal rules, yes. Can you do things to empower yourself and to get past that point? Yes. Does it take a lot of work? Definitely. And that's, again, where trying to utilize my platform for more than just pictures of drinks, because that's where T.Drinks kind of comes from, is that 
I'm a Toronto born boy. Very proud. I'm a very proud man being from Toronto. I love my hometown. If I had to be, if I had to come back in another lifetime, I'd still choose to be born in Toronto. I love Toronto. Um, T dot drinks came out of a line of thinking of utilizing drinks um, as a means to showcase my hometown, whether it is by way of taking pictures of different parts of the city, whether it's by way of highlighting uh, brewers, distillers, or any kind of drink maker. Cause I, I, I take pictures of anything liquid that's in Toronto, if, especially if it is something handcrafted, um, and it is done by somebody in Toronto or done by somebody who may not be from Toronto, but they have a store of, uh, you know, a base in Toronto and they're doing uh, handcrafted goods. I, I want to do my part to try to like do that whole support, loop move, you know, support local movement and, and help bring people's attention to the fact that, oh, you know, uh, I love to do beer pairings and drink pairings. Oh, you, you know that you, you're looking for something for lunch and you're thinking, I want a burger. I'm going to go to, I'm going to McDonald's. Well, what if I got this really cool burger joint um, that's owned by a really cool person and the food tastes, you know, the burger's a bomb. I ha I, I, I'm not going to put my name behind something if I have no clue what it's about. So I'm eating the food and I'm loving it. And I'm like, yeah, I'm going to take a picture, put it up there. And it's like that way when you come on my page, Oh, where's this place that burger looks delicious and you know and i and you know this dude loves beer and okay well where is that place and then you can obviously click on a picture and the link comes up and you press the link takes you to their page and you're seeing places that are in and around the city um i love doing stuff like that that's all part and parcel of what t dot drinks was developed for the other part is simply my artistic side my artistic side has constantly traveled with me uh, from birth. Music is my first love. Um, but being able to, when I started taking pictures specifically of drinks, um, I found, I, I rediscovered my voice in a different format. And I found such relief and happiness and joy from being able to take some of the pictures I've taken and uh, every so often somebody compliments the picture, but in a way where it left some kind of lasting effect on them. And that's the other part of why I do it is, is to try to like put some good into the world. And, and if you saw a picture and you liked it and you're like, Oh man, I didn't know you were into Marvel comics, dude. It's like, I'm, I'm a big kid. I'm such yeah. a big kid. You know, our household is very much, we got love for DC, but it's very much a Marvel household. And, you know, and, and you, you strike up a conversation. People know me, know my favorite character is Wolverine. So we get into like really great converse, fun conversations about comics and cartoons and, anime and stuff like that or you know um you know whatever like i love i love transformers ever since of, you know since 84 when it came out i've been yeah watching i mean we're only three years apart so yeah. I'm, I'm a kid of the 80s 90s just like you it's yeah. you know transformers gi joe yeah um gargoyles like all Gar of it it's, all of it right so. it, and and it's like being able to interact with it uh now that i'm older and be able to share that love that joy that passion with our daughter and what I tremendously love about both ladies that are closest to me in my life is this one uniting fact, whatever they love, even if I share the interest with one or both of them, and this is part of the reason why she wears the other one of these things, <laughs> I can love something for my reasons and I can bring it to her attention. And Miyoshi will always give me her honest reaction and opinion of that thing. And even when she loves it as much as I do, or maybe even sometimes more, uh, I still walk away learning something from her about that thing that I've spent most of my love, most of my life loving, you know, uh, anything. Like we've had, uh, we could have a discussion about music and she knows I'm such a sucker for Stevie Wonder. That's that my that's my boy. I love Stevie. And we can have a discussion about a song by Stevie. And 
she can tell me something from her perspective that she took away from a song that I love by Stevie. And Miyoshi will teach me something I never thought of, or I, you know, maybe it was always under the surface, but she kind of lifts up that layer in my brain and pushes it forward to be like, boom. And I'm like, <laughs> holy cow. Yeah. Right. Mind blowing. Exactly. Um, and that's something I have always uh, loved and respected about her. And it's something that I've been blessed with the pleasure of seeing in our daughter, the amount of things that we have, uh, collabor uh, collaboratively and individually introduced um, our daughter to uh, from aspects of uh, heritage and culture, art, uh, cartoons, anime, movies, music, uh, anything, anything that we got a love for and we share it with her. Um, it's so dope to learn through her eyes and to get her perspective clay right and, she's basically still clay to you guys yeah. they're still molding to but, the future but, woman that she's going to become so you know what i mean and but at the same time it's like imagine the clay well not imagine the clay is living mm -hmm. but imagine that you're actually playing with clay with molding clay and you're getting your hands in it and then the clay starts to wrap around your hands and just starts to to interact with you and come off of you and pull up this amazing butterfly or flower or fireworks. Mm -hmm. And you're just like, I have that in me. <laughs> you intertwined yourself in me and pulled away. And this is what you got out of that experience with me. And it, I mean, it floors me. It mm -hmm. absolutely floors me. It's one of my joys of being, not just being a dad, not just being to uh, quote Kobe, rest in peace, a girl dad, but most importantly, being her dad. Uh, it's, it's absolutely one of the joys. Parenting is a lot of joy and even more pain. But <laughs> I'm going to tell you, I tell people all the time, it is not for everybody. But if you determine that it is for you, it's the best gig you will ever have. For people who it's not meant for, it's just not meant for. I ain't mad at you. I <laughs> salute you for embracing your truth and knowing that parenting is not for you. You're good being the aunt and uncle. You're good being a godparent. You're good just being a positive adult role model in a young person like my daughter's life. I salute you when you do those things. And I salute you more importantly, when you don't allow people to shame you into being uh, feeling a ways because you choose not to bring a life into this world. That's a very personal decision. And I don't knock anybody who says, uh, uh, not for me. I say good on you. What I do say though, like I said, is if you decide it's for you and you engage in it, not just have a kid to have a kid and then suddenly yeah. discover, Oh, it really ain't for me. No, I'm saying you really put some thought into this and then you make up your mind. Okay, let's do this. And you help bring a life into this world and you engage in that life and you interact in that life and you help mold, like you said, mold a, a young person into maturity and to back away every day, a little bit more. That's one of the many beautiful lessons that Miyoshi has taught me from the day from before she came, but specifically the day that she arrived into this world. Miyoshi reminded me, every day, Eddie, <laughs> let go. Just a little bit, a little bit. Because if you wait until she's 10, 15, yeah. 20, you're going to be in trouble. <laughs> yeah. You're going to be in trouble. And I'm telling you because this is my plan. Every day I learn to let go a little bit more of her because you have to remember she's only here to live her truth and to walk her path. She's only born. She's only loaned to us to have that blessing and then to let her not let her, but to encourage and support her continued journey. Her journey is hers even the minute she comes here and she's a, a million percent dependent on us. That's not the point. The point is, is that we come here with a purpose. She has a purpose from birth. Got nothing to do with you or me. So we have to learn to do that every day. 
This woman's got jewels upon jewels. <laughs> but that's one of the many jewels. Yeah, it's, and it's beautiful it, here too. So yeah. And, and and it has served me incredibly well over the years. But this this is all part and parcel of bringing it back into our main topic of discussion is using my platform to try to make even the smallest or largest dent I can possibly make in the lack of diversity in breweries. What I need from breweries, work with more black content creators, not to plug, but to shamelessly plug myself, <laughs> I'm going to do it. Myself, my wife, work with more black content creators, with shaping the vision, work with more of us doing PR. This is something both Miyoshi and I uh, do outside of what we do on Instagram, right? Is helping shape voices. Work with people who understand the inner workings and how the inner workings impact the conscious awareness of diversity and the lack thereof in your workplace, in your brewery facilities, like Ren with Bear Diversity. Work with us. Yes. That's what I want breweries to do. Work with us. I don't just want to get a payday because I am black and I showed up. That's not my point either. My point is our voices, like our lives, matter. And when you're there busy worrying about how you appear to people that just look like you, you often overlook the fact of how you appear to people that look like us. It's not really rocket science. It isn't. But for you to have an approach of focusing on making your environment more welcoming to all people. I'm not telling any brewery owner or operator that you got to be there. The minute I walk in the joint, you got to be there shaking my hand. You got to be there kissing my feet, throwing down rose petals, pulling out a seat for me. Uh, you know, you got to personally serve me. I'm not saying any of those things. That's ridiculous. And that doesn't solve or address the problem. And that's the bigger issue. Being kind or thoughtful to one or two customers who are people of color, that from when they walk in the joint and you take a look at them for whatever features they may have, whatever skin pigmentation they may have, you in your head figure this is a person of color. This is a black person or indigenous person or whomever. You don't believe that person to be a white person. You should not be going out of your way to make that one customer or that one party or that one group uh, of people feel comfortable for that one visit to your brewery. It should, you know. should be a default when you think about it. Equality should not be anything less than the norm for every person that walks through the door. You know, I don't want to be treated as an equal, as an exception. I want to be treated respectfully as a norm because I am still a man like you're a man on the other end of this camera from me. And I love the face looking back at me. And I feel the face looking back at me loves me. And that's what it should be about. That's where the sense of community comes in. For all of the things that have been done to our indigenous brothers and sisters, they had the blueprints of community before any European tried to come over and tell them you know, how, how, you know, you know, the term, of course, that we hear yeah. nowadays, mansplaining, right? Well, I don't know what the Euro equivalent Euro explaining? You know, I guess so. Explain, what, uh, white explaining, I don't know. I guess, but, well, <laughs> but, uh, I mean, I don't, because I, I know the States was basically created because England wasn't religious enough for the people who came to America. Uh, I don't know about Canada, on the other hand, because 
with I believe I believe the intent was the same all along, regardless of who went where and which explorer ended up where. Um, and then the tales and the lies about which explorers ended up where, because the joke is, and Miyoshi could tell you this very well, being Bahamian, Columbus didn't get any farther than the Bahamas. He hit the Bahamas. He never, ever set his foot on American soil, ever. But yet the lie and the story told is in, you know, 1482, 1492, whatever it is, Columbus sailed the the ocean blue blue and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, no, he never hit America. And for all these people who are such um, up in arms at people uh, defiling the Columbus, various Columbus statues in various places in the States, and they're like, ah, they're making all this noise. It's like, but okay, please tell me one thing, sir. One thing, and then I'm going to walk away if I'm wrong. Forgive me if I'm wrong in advance. Your italian american right like how it's african american you're italian american right yeah it was to you so let me ask you another question were you born in rome genoa milan sicily no okay was your mom no okay grandma nona yes okay cool so you're second generation American. <laughs> do you not yeah. do you not kind of get where I'm going with that, buddy? Do you not understand you're being so aggressively defensive of something that really has nothing to do with you? Um, you're celebrating a person who deceived his way into his position, smooth talked the queen of another nation because Italy initially was like to Christopher Columbus. They <laughs> yeah. weren't trying to fund him. They weren't trying to support him. That's what people forget, obviously. They were not down with his program. So he had to go all the way over to Spain, sweet talk the Queen Isabella into giving him the supplies, the, the uh, sailors, and the three ships, right? He had to do all of that. Yet you guys are like, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> Yo, you're you, the country of your heritage, okay? Where you are 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 twice removed from because you're second generation American, okay? The country of your heritage, like Trinidad is my heritage. The country of your heritage didn't give a bloody damn about Columbus until he claimed that he got to America, which he never did, but until he hit landfall. And then word got back that he actually did what they thought he couldn't do. And then they felt, you know, they felt embarrassed. So they're like, oh, you know what I mean? It's like somebody from you is all about you. They have to leave and go to another country to get support to do what they're doing. But then you try to take all the credit. Oh, yeah, that's our countrymen. Yeah. Ah, hurrah, you know, no, no. You know what I mean? But just to see all these different things and to hear the stories to to know to know that the original human is from Africa. Yeah, Mesopotamia. So that means every single person, regardless of genes, DNA, all the rest of it, every single person has at least anywhere from half to one full percent of African in them. Oh, that's that's why this is so dark because I know there's history in my family why my beard is almost dark, like black. There you like, go. As we know, we were aware we do have family history. Like there is somebody in the in the bloodline that is African. We know that. Yeah. We accept right? that. But that's my family. This isn't all families. So. Yeah. But 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 that's my point though is that every single person, regardless of how many generations removed or blah 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 whatever like i said even if it's only half to one full percent but there's at least one percent of your bloodline that will go all the way directly back to the source of all humanity which is any place any country on the continent of africa so from that perspective all the other arguments all of the other (laughs) ignorance it's all a moot point it's all stupidity we have we have a way that we call it like when you have the hot tears so it's like when you are so angry that you, you 
feel your tears well up in your eyes and they're hot. Mm -hmm. Right. So I felt myself getting the hot tears and I was getting frustrated and angry. 